I know people are very interested in this old house we've assumed responsibility for, so today I'm excited to give you a tour, show you some of the precious mementos that have been hidden away here, and reveal some of the plans we've had in the works. Watch until the end for a very strange giveaway that you might not even want. How's that for a hook? You might not even want it because it's gross and strange and something I found here at the house. Hey all, Bitsy here. Wanted to do something a little bit different today, so we're gonna do a house tour. We live on a complex that has four buildings, but we only live in one of the houses. So the second house, which is behind me here, is a 100-year-old Kominka folk house. And today I wanted to kind of give you a tour and show you inside and talk about some of the plans that we have for fixing it up and welcoming people in the future. So we live in the newer house attached next door, but this house is 100 years old, built in the Taisho era. That's a rough date, but for history buffs, 1923 was the year of the Great Kanto earthquake in Tokyo and Yokohama. Our kind landlord grew up here, and her mother and grandparents also lived here. Not only did they live here, but the Kazoku no Ohaka, or small family cemetery, is on this property. That is a private cemetery for the ashes of the deceased family, and the living family members sometimes visit to pay respects. So this is a precious place that we want to do our best to take care of and respect. The location here is about half a hectare of terraced mountain land piped with spring water. On the property, and also a short drive away, my partner manages kiwi trees. We recently saw our first harvest of about 20 crates. Some of these will be available for sale domestically in Japan, so click the link below if you would like to support our work by ordering some kiwi that were grown without chemicals. There is a link to his shop below. The closest city center is Ozu, Ehime Prefecture. Ozu is a castle town with some very fashionable restoration and interesting activities to see. But we are a fair ways away, buried behind many windy roads deep in the mountains. A quick note to any new visitors to this channel about why we are here and how we ended up in the middle of nowhere Japan. Long story short, I'm an expat who burned out on my corporate designer work. I kind of reached the end of my ability to deal with the state of things. Simultaneously, my now husband was working as a landscaper outside of Tokyo and accepted a new position to start a business and be a part of a rural revitalization team. So we both happened to move to Ehime Prefecture at the same time. He is a garden designer, and I'm an interior designer. We held some similar values and ideas, so we paired up and took off. The values I'm talking about are motai nai, as in waste not want not, <laughs> living a modest life, and living connected to the land, growing as much of our own food as we can, and having more ownership over our work and daily life. So the current state of things is that we are working together with our sweet landlord to try and envision a new life for this estate that has held many precious memories and full lives. It's full of memories, but it's also full of stuff. Let me show you around. First we have the entry, Genkan area. This is the Doma area, which is sheltered, but a semi-exterior space with compressed dirt floors called tataki. You keep outdoor shoes on, and cooking and work tasks would also be done in this area. From here, the tatami floor plane is raised to allow ventilation under the floor and makes it easier to keep the raised floor clean. 
In the main living space, there are sliding shoji screens between the engawa veranda space and the tatami room. The windows and screens are all newer and in good working condition. The Fusuma sliding interior doors were replaced in this house at some time. Often there are natural scenes painted, but these doors have a vinyl face and the non-square beams have been retrofitted so they can close properly. One of the most prominent features of this space is the vintage tansu, or cupboards, which spans the entire back of the first room. It also has a built-in Buddhist altar. Also noteworthy of the tansu is that they are full of stuff. Dishes and mementos, some of it is older, some of it is newer. My partner likes to drill holes in the bottom, take small forest plants and make motainai bonsai plants. I've taken and cleaned some items for our daily use in the main house. We also have considered opening a free shop from one of our warehouse areas where people can come and take what they want. We've also found this super cool old record player with speakers, but unfortunately the needle is gone and the replacement is more expensive than a new record player. And this old sewing machine that is very cool and retro, but it doesn't work. Email me if you want either of these things free if you pick them up. Tsuchikabe walls like this are mud, sand, and straw. Sometimes the top layer will be bright white shikui plaster, but this seems modest and suitable for this building. I love details like the mud wall because modern day architectural design often relies on using nature as a symbol rather than the soul trying to remind people of nature through facades, pictures, or patterns rather than show it and be it and live it. The ceiling has a red coating called bengara, whose main ingredient is iron oxide and is resistant to infestation and elements. The roof used to be wada rice straw. And of course, old folk houses, minka, had different architectural goals depending on the region. So in hot areas like the Kyomachiya in Kyoto, the long row houses needed airflow and so the architectural response was to create shade and circulation. Here, I'm very glad that that is not our summer problem because humid heat can be unbearable. Luckily in summer, I was able to survive in the main residence with only a fan and no air conditioning. But along with the summer benefits of a cool altitude, we also get snow and drafty winters. The old thatched roofs were used to hold heat from the irori in the house. This property used to have a wet rice field and I would assume the grasses from this very location were used to pile the roof, along with grasses from neighboring farms. But the field is no longer used for rice, and after the previous roof reached the end of its life, a tile roof was used to replace it. The irori would be constantly burning in a house like this. It would be used not just for cooking, but the ash and the drying effect would keep the roof and beams dry, also discouraging infestation. Heat pushed the smoke up through an opening in the ceiling. Then it wafts through the structure and escapes through corners and crevices. The irori is a semi-public area, next to the entrance. There is a tokonoma, or alcove, here. Traditionally, there would be kakemono, or an artistic scroll, that would be changed every season, and maybe an ikebana floral arrangement. There are two unavoidable tasks that need to be done before anything else. 
The roof is planned to be replaced and we need to clean out the stuff. There are walls, beams, and boards that should be replaced, but we can't get to them before removing the various items all throughout the house. Dishes, tools, unworking appliances. This takes time, effort, and money. And sorry, but I've got a disclaimer. What I'm about to show you is in consideration. We haven't confirmed any plans yet. And even if I did feel solid about it, I should really learn from my mistakes about telling the internet I plan to do something. The hard facts here are that we are considering making a guest house, but I've run a few financial models, and the long story short is none of them work. And while I've seen other internet renovators go in the red out of passion, we don't have any spare money laying around to do that. That being said, we've been considering changing this building from a residence to a guest house and we've been considering various aspects of the design from a few angles. So for your viewing pleasure, here they are. I started by considering how an old Cominca house can feel more alive to modern sensibilities, and came up with five basic kind of generic directions that could really be applied to any Cominca in Japan. By the way, all of this is also on the Inaka Lifestyle Pinterest page for any of you who are also embarking on your own projects. The first direction is clean and bright. The color from this palette comes only from the wood. It is a bright feeling, but might not hold messy people and dirty farmers very gracefully. This is the kind of aesthetic that I naturally gravitate to, but that might also be a cultural bias as my ancestry is Scandinavian, where white interiors are extremely common and also a natural counteraction to the long dark winters of the North. But for this house, there are elements like the dark beams, dark ceiling, and mud walls that we want to keep, but it wouldn't fit well with this direction. The next direction is the opposite, dark and moody. This direction carries wear well. I mean, worn, scratched wood, smoky beams, and dirty doma floors. It creates special moments well, but is also reminiscent of a bar or luxury space. We would like to facilitate some magic moments here, but this mood is a big departure from the spirit of the local environment, which is farming grannies and greatly values modesty. This might work better for somewhere like Kyoto. Next up is a focus on the natural environment, as my partner is a gardener. He often gravitates toward landscaping that combines natural growth patterns with austerity. From the architectural perspective, the house is a neutral backdrop that mostly frames the experience of the landscaping. This is very important for our site because it is a living portfolio of Mr. Nakamura's landscaping work, and the house is situated to experience it well. The shortcomings of this style for our project is that there needs to be a balance between austerity and stuff. I mean, both mood-wise and literally. I think the austerity would be easily sabotaged by the things that we have around here on a daily basis. We have never had a clean front yard, not one day. There are always seedlings, hanging persimmons, drying flowers, cleaning projects, things drying in the sun or whatever. There is danger in having things when the inherent beauty of the existing home rests in its unadorned natural quality. But I think we might not be capable of pulling off a sufficient degree of minimalism based on our lifestyle. The next style idea is nostalgia. I love this option because it is fun, casual, and we would be able to reuse a lot of stuff. I mean the retro dishes, the furniture, the stove, etc. that are here in the house. It's kind of a hodgepodge. But the other good thing about this style is that it honors the long life that this house has seen. The structure wasn't frozen the moment it was built. It has seen lifetimes, auspicious occasions, trends and Showa pop culture, shifting generational beliefs, and now itself is shifting into a new life as more than a home. This direction holds all of that history and heritage. Not only the moment it was built, but the moment we moved in, the whole thing. But the downside of this direction is that in this old, old house, we run the risk of it being too much old stuff. 
so that it might become a dusty place where you wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable sleeping. It might be a bit creepy. So these moods aren't really personal, they are simply reflections of the trends I've seen in Kominka renovations. We want to be different than what is currently available in our immediate area, but we want to still be a natural feeling extension of our community. We want to respect the past family, but we also want to create a space that is natural for us to maintain and share. So we came up with another style that might do that best, which centers on the theme of permaculture. We have been working on growing food, preparing for animals, and really embracing the motai nai sustainability sensibility of waste not want not. We've been learning from the landlord, who took us to harvest bamboo shoots in the bamboo grove, taught us to maintain the water, and has shared her cooking and history with us. Anticipating guests, we want to share knowledge through a library corner, cooking together, doing bonsai, ikebana, kokedama workshops, and also learning from our guests. This direction accommodates many Japanese ideas, but also feels a bit more eclectic. We want to be creative and resourceful in the ways we garden and cook using nature, which pushes outside of the traditional Japanese aesthetic. Doing something solidly eclectic could hold space for Japanese features like the sunken fireplace and the perfectly framed landscape view. But it could also accommodate Western comfort aspects such as having cozy seating, games, and gathering spaces. As far as the design direction for this house goes, it's a little bit complicated um, because you've got a lot of different perspectives. A lot of my YouTube viewers are going to be Western people who, whether they know it or not, share a lot of same kind of values or ideas about how renovations are done and what constitutes good taste. But for a place like this, it's very apparent to me kind of this dichotomy between my background and my assumptions and the community around me, especially because I'm in a bicultural marriage. Even my immediate partner holds different ideas and values about how this renovation should be done. So it's taking a, a bit of time for us to just kind of wrap our heads around what shape that's going to take. And while there is something that could be perceived as artificial or disingenuous about projects done in the eye of the internet, it would be even more disingenuous to ignore the fact that there are now tens of thousands of people who have visited our home here via YouTube, more than there will ever be in person. When I asked our landlord, who we turned to for guidance and as a collaborator for this place, I asked about her vision. Something she was interested in was sharing Japanese culture. Not only Tokyo and fancy temples, but the heart and soul of what exists in places like this one. I think she will be happy to see us share the great parts of a modest Japanese countryside culture with as many people as possible. So if you found value in this video or channel, I hope you will consider sharing it with a friend who might also be interested. but I'm also interested in your opinions and what you want to see. So uh, feel free to drop a comment and let me know what your ideas are, or what kind of place you would want to visit when this house opens up to the public. This is all going to take a while to finish because we are pretty much doing it on our own and with our landlord. Also, we are balancing this with other work and projects to try and make a living. As a foreign person, there aren't many job options in a place that is so remote like this. And my partner is pursuing permaculture and organic farming, which is a difficult path. So if you have the ability, please consider becoming a part of our Patreon fam family. We want to promote a fulfilling, modest, and responsible lifestyle that isn't based on purchasing and promotions. We want to provide a slice of life here in as meaningful and responsible of a way as possible. Like Thank you for your support and consideration. You should see the Patreon link in the description below. And if financial support isn't an option, I appreciate your non-monetary support in likes, comments, and subscriptions. And now for the giveaway. So this is super strange and a lot of people might be grossed out, but I found some snake skin on our property. 
Snakeskin in Japanese folklore is said to attract money and good fortune, as a snake shedding skin is a symbol of infinite life, growth, and fertility. It is an auspicious practice to keep snakeskin in your wallet to bring financial prosperity. So I disinfected the skin and made these little packets that you can keep in your wallet. And with this, we are hosting the world's weirdest Instagram giveaway. Here's what you need to do. Go follow me on Instagram and like the post called Start Here. Then comment and tag a friend who you think might be interested in our story. On New Year's Day 2024, I'll randomly choose 15 people and send you a snakeskin. Anywhere in the world that you can receive mail is okay. Just be sure to keep an eye on your DMs. Limit one entry per account. And hey, if you actually want this thing, your chances are pretty good because I'm not that popular. Thanks for joining. See you next time.